All right, I am live with a, a, a man by the name of Trent Luce, who it's honestly a little bit of a shock we're even having a conversation right now, because Trent first found out about us when we were out at Sunrise Farms in May uh, doing a demonstration there. And Trent, for those of you who don't know about him, he's got a podcast, is a very prominent farmer, sixth generation farmer, cattle farmer, is it, Trent? Uh, we raise pigs, cattle, and horses. Pigs, pigs cattle, and horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, is famous for saying that DXE activists are thugs that were sociopaths and, and really going to bat for the industry when we did this demonstration back in May. So can I just start by asking you, Trent, a little bit about how you, how you found yourself in Petaluma back in May and, and how we ended up having this conversation today on Facebook Live? Thank you, Wayne. I appreciate that opportunity or the opportunity to join you. Uh, I do want to question you right off the bat before I tell you why I was in Petaluma. I'm not sure. sure I'm famous for that. I did say that. I'm not saying I didn't say that, but I don't think it made me famous. Yeah, I think that you're probably right about that. So <laughs> I think you're famous in animal rights circles and in vegan circles, which is is kind of like being famous in a tiny island in the Pacific. So because there aren't yeah, a lot of animal I'm, rights activists and vegans in the world yet, but. But tell me, tell See, us a little bit about there how we, you, there how you again, ended up we, there. We, we've reached common ground already we right off the bat. We've reached common ground. Yeah. Well, uh, I would love to say that I heard about you uh, criminally breaking in to a farm uh -huh. in Petaluma. I jumped in my jet and flew out there to get the real story. But <laughs> number one, I don't have a jet. And number two, I was accidentally already in Petaluma. Sure. Um, ironically, I was uh, filming for a movie i'm coming a movie that's coming out in the spring and naturally when i heard about what had happened i i started doing research because i have been working on this type of thing for the past 20 years this type of thing being making sure that people make purchase decisions making sure that people develop policy making sure that the general perception of what is happening is factual sure and i i saw you presenting things that just simply aren't factual when it comes to modern food production. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that makes me think two things that we probably do agree on. One is, and I said this to you, I mean, we only talked for about a minute before we started this live stream, but I said there are actually a lot of things we probably find common ground on. And one of them, and I want to give you a big shout out for this, is I think there are a lot of people in this country who think something wrong is happening and are not empowered mm -hmm. to actually do something about it. And, and that's something you and I are similar on, that you saw something happening in May that you thought was wrong, and you did something about it. And, and I've got mad respect for you for that because that shows something about your character and commitment to make the world a better place, that you saw something wrong was happening, that you thought was wrong, and you directly intervened with it. Second is, yeah. I think well, we, we absolutely agree, agree on that, Wayne, agree. because and, and I, just uh, let me just I, I see, oh, go ahead, I go see our great challenge is complacency. Yeah. We have too many people that will sit around and talk about things but not address you personally. In fact, I sent you two messages that obviously didn't get to you because I've invited you to join me on my radio program talking about this. I didn't just do that behind For your sure. back and then say, hey, I don't want it. You know, I'm just going to talk about this guy. I, I, I would love to take you up on that offer and, and give well, we're your audience doing it a now. chance to hear from, from a, a Buddhist vegan, which is not probably their, <laughs> their, their, their most common experience in life. But the second thing I think we agree on is, and you just said this yourself, that you want true and accurate information to come out about, about people's consumption habits and, and for consumers and citizens of the United States to get accurate information. Um, and I think we both agree that false advertising, whether it's by activists or by farmers, is, is not wrong and should, is, is wrong and should be corrected. It is wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe we could talk, you know, I have a series of statements that I think, and I was telling you that I think we probably agree on and some statements that I think we, could, we disagree on. One example of false advertising I think we could probably both agree on is, is what tobacco companies and cigarette companies did in back in the 1960s, where they're saying cigarettes are healthy, they're going to improve digestive health, and, uh, and don't worry about cancer and emphysema, those things aren't real. I don't know what you think about that, but my guess is both of us think that those, those advertisements are wrong. Am I right about that? Uh, actually, you're bringing up something I didn't think this could happen, something that I'm not familiar with. Okay. I did not know that uh, tobacco companies once portrayed smoking as a health item. Yeah, they did. Uh, anybody that would perceive putting any piece of, of any material in front of your face and smoking it nonstop, inhaling uh, smoke and, and fire, and before we m knew much about nicotine, they're not thinking very clearly if they believe that's a healthy item. <laughs> You're probably right about that. Yeah, but right. back in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of people did. And, 
in, in the country where my parents are from. I was, you know, I told you earlier, I was born and raised in Indiana. My parents were born in China and they emigrated here in one of the first wave of immigrants from China in, in the, the early 1970s. But in my home country of China, there's still a lot of people who think smoking is healthy because mm -hmm. the advertising is not well regulated. And, and tobacco companies do say a lot of good things. They, they say it's going to clarify your lungs. It's like incense. And, and a lot of people in, in China, they think incense is healthy and it's good for you. And they don't see a difference between smoking and incense. And, and so it's led to massively high smoking rates and the increase in things like emphysia, lung cancer, metabolic disease in, in ways that have never before been seen in, in China. Um, so that is an area where we probably agree that smoking is not healthy and people probably should say it's healthy. So here's, here's where I think we're probably going to disagree, that there's false advertising of animal products and that animal products are often extremely unhealthy, including afflicted with diseases that could kill and hurt our kids. I mean, do you agree with that or disagree with that? My guess is you disagree with that. I, I disagree with that. I'm still on smoking. Sure, go ahead. Uh, it's a little tough to blame the health implications, breathing issues, simply on smoking in China. Yeah. Uh, just today I had a, a great radio program with a friend of mine who I have on every week who's married to a young lady who migrated herself from China. Yeah, yeah. And Hank has been back the past three years, and he says that progressively his term today was that there's enough uh, stuff in the atmosphere that he could plant wheat so to come back and 100 percent blame smoking for everything that's been caused in China is that's that's an exaggeration and an embellishment. And to follow that up, did you know that it is illegal in every park in the United States to smoke? In every park, really? Every park, national every parks, state parks, park, local national parks, national park, a national park. It is illegal to smoke. And do you know what the number one reason was for banning smoking in outdoor parks? My guess is it's forest fires, no? No, no. secondhand smoke. Secondhand they, smoke, wow. They convince people that if there's a, if you're smoking and you're in proximity to someone who's smoking, you have a health hazard equal to that of the person that's smoking. Yeah. You know how much science, Wayne, there is to back that up? I think there's a little. I've seen some of it myself. Zero. zero. So Outdoor, in an outdoor environment. There is zero science to back up the, fa the fact that we should ban smoking in outdoor parks. Yet, nobody threw a fit. Nobody objected because it's taboo to talk positively about smoking today. Sure. Yeah, It wasn't based in science. It was based on emotion. Yeah, And that is the biggest problem that I have is that so many things that we perceive as being unhealthy or not the way to go is based upon a perception. Sure. It's propaganda. Of what the science actually says. Yeah. No, I agree with that completely. So, you know, I mean, maybe we should talk about what happens in factory farms then and why I think they are a risk to human health. I, you probably know this. And, and if you don't, I'll tell you right now that 70, 80 percent of all the antibiotics in this nation, critical human grade antibiotics are used by factory farms, by animal agriculture. Yeah, they're used I know more about that. Than you. Yeah, you probably do. Because what I we do. actually learned about Trent, folks, is Trent has actually been talking to and working with animal rights activists for two decades. I think he's been to more animal rights conferences than I have, <laughs> and he might know more of the major players in the animal rights than I do. Because you know, DXC is a fairly new player. We've been around for five years, and I've been an animal rights yeah. activist longer than that. But I've only been meeting with and connecting with some of the influential folks, frankly, like Trent himself, in the industry or in the movement for the past five or so years. So 78% of all, all the critical human-grade antibiotics in this nation are being fed to farm animals. And it is crazy. Wait, 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 Wayne. How did that number arrive? How did we arrive at that number? Where did you get that number? That number comes from the Centers for Disease Control. No, that number does not come from the Centers for Disease Control. It comes from the Union of Concerned Scientists who projected that number based upon looking at every available antibiotic to animal agriculture. And we produce just short of 10 billion of them each year in this country. And so what they did was they said, well, if there's 10 billion animals and we can use this antibiotic, this antibiotic, and this antibiotic at this level, they projected that the actual use would be at the maximum years. allowable. And that is absolutely false. Yeah. The number is at least half of that and probably less than half of that. Around 30 to 35 percent is what uh, the American Health Institute has said is actually fed to animals. But it continues to be less and less each year because, so what, Wayne, yeah, I, have, I have personally cared for one million animals in my lifetime. Wow. So I've been at every level of animal agriculture. I'm sixth generation. My family's been tending to animals in the United States since 1832. Mm -hmm. What's the most expensive 
what is the one uh, a, uh, ingredient that I want to minimize my use in my animals? Antibiotics. My guess, my guess is it's antibiotics because it's, antibiotics it's dangerous to you too. That's the last thing that I want so, to use. But let me, let me ask you this, Trent. Whether the number is 35% or 70%, and I'm going to have to say, I, I'm going to be... I'm going to say I, I trust the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Centers of Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health more than I do any other organization in the world. Because these are the organizations he, he that are intent that. on, these are the organizations that have been tasked and have the world's renowned experts in controlling antibiotic resistant disease. But whether the number is 35 or 70 percent, there's no doubt that there is a massive amount of, of drug usage inside animal agriculture. And furthermore, that when you use drugs, especially in a preventive way, and I don't think there's any disagreement here either that companies like Smithfield Foods, they even announced that we're using drugs preventively. I could show you trial transcripts from the recent litigation in North Carolina where the, the chief scientist at Smithfield will be saying and has said that we give every single animal who comes through our farm drugs in the water and the food because if we don't, we're afraid they're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And that drug usage doesn't just show cruelty because if animals are all suffering from diseases because of intensive confinement and filth, they're hurting. They're feeling pain. But it's also a danger to ordinary citizens like you. And do you have any kids, Trent? I have three daughters. Yeah. I mean, are you worried I have, if, that your kids are, are going to get sick someday because, and that the drugs no. aren't going to be effective to help them get back? Uh, actually, the opposite. My kids the opposite. You uh, want don't kids get, to get sick, sick. Ah, because <laughs> we develop immunity because of exposure, exposure. to fecal material and all of the things that comes along with animal agriculture. In fact, New Zealand has a study that says animal or farmers who deal with animals yeah. are five times less likely to contract any disease, including cancer, simply because we interact with animals. Much like you have some level of immunity because you got this dog that keeps running back and forth behind right. you, Wayne. That dog is shedding a dander that creates an immunity for you as yeah. well. You're right. And my kids who interact with animals on a daily basis develop an immunity which benefits them and their them their bodies for the rest of their life yeah so here's the that's difference. why we have if you had allergies by if them. you had kids Pe and dogs in your house that you were giving penicillin every single day at low level rates that didn't actually kill off the bacterial infection that was in them and they lived this way for years and years and years and you kept giving them not just penicillin but gentamicin you know tetracycline and all these powerful human grade antibiotics that are important for some emergency room We've got a hospital that's just a, a few blocks from here in, in East Bay. It's called Alta Bates. And there are a lot of older folks in, in the Berkeley area. And older folks don't have very strong immune systems. And I've got friends who work in hospitals. My brother-in-law is actually a doctor who says lots of times people are coming in with infections now and our drugs are not working. And the best hypothesis, in fact, it's not even a hypothesis now. There's credible scientific evidence in peer-reviewed journals like Science and Nature showing that, for example, MRSA, you know what MRSA is, I'm sure. Methicillin I do. I also know that every single person has MRSA in their body, including you and I, whether you deal with animals or not. It's common. It is. Every, every person. It is. But there's pathogenic, deadly forms of MRSA that afflict people at, the, at a rate that is six times higher in the immediate vicinity of a factory farm, in particular a pig farm, than in other mm -hmm. places in this country. Six times. Right? This is and undisputed that, scientific that evidence. Study came from the University of Iowa, and I personally found flaws in that study because they ignored the fact that MRSA was present in every single person. They did not show you what the data said about the people who in that general area that had no exposure to animal agriculture, sure. and but, it was equal, but yeah, that got right, left out could, of the equation. But the University of Iowa is hardly animal rights territory, right? The University of Iowa is a, is a farm. Uh, if it's you're a farm from college. Iowa, you don't have a, a lot of allegiance to the University of Iowa because it is the liberal university. The true animal folks go to Iowa State, Wayne. It's like saying that you're going to go to the University of Indiana and expect you to be animal welfare sensitivity. Sure. Well, the folks that truly deal with animal welfare are at Purdue, Purdue University. Yeah. Indiana University and Purdue are different in Iowa State and Iowa. I don't doubt that they're different. But right. Iowa has a big ag school. In fact, I actually do a lot of my research on commercial practices in the industry by going to the University of Iowa's extension program because they have all these that, great materials. I, but let's move the on The University to of else. Iowa does not have an extension program. The Iowa extension program is from Iowa State, not the University of Iowa. Okay, you might be right about that. So I, mean, I said and, this, and is, one, of this things, is one of the great but, things about talking to people like Trent, right? I hope I can learn some things from Trent. And Trent, maybe you'll learn some things from me. And this is why... I think we have to have these discussions and dialogues because I'm going to say right now, and I told Trent earlier today when we were on, on a little, little Skype conversation prior to this live stream, 
that I don't know everything and I can be a buffoon and an idiot and I want Trent to be the one who calls me out if I do say something that's wrong. And I appreciate that, Trent, that it's not Iowa State or it's not the University of Iowa, it's Iowa State. That does an extension program. Yeah. Back to antibiotic usage. Sure. Uh, and I believe that antibiotics are a tool. They are. We tools. don't personally use it on every animal. Yeah, I yeah. use antibiotics as a treatment only, but that's my personal choice. I don't believe that you or I should remove the tools from Smithfield or anybody else in animal agriculture to promote the healthiest animal possible for the safest food supply. Case in point, Denmark banned antibiotic usage at the subtherapeutic level, which you're referring to in, in 1998. Mm -hmm. And within 10 years, the therapeutic use of antibiotics had tripled. They were using three times the amount of total antibiotics. It, it's the basic, old, your mom, I guarantee you, mom, or your mom, Wayne, said an ounce of prevention, Wayne's worth a pound of cure. Yeah. And so what you see happening with modern facilities, and I'm going to say just pretty much across the board, antibiotics are used judiciously. If they're used on every animal, they're used at a very short period of time for a very specific reason. And then those animals are off of antibiotics because I repeat, it is the most expensive and the one item that we do not want to put on our animals unless we need to. There's yeah, I mean, a purpose. I think, I think what, what we can use as a contrasting example is China, where they're no, rea no regulations whatsoever of the use of antibiotics. And we found in China is not only massive increases, probably far higher than what we've seen in Denmark, but also the beginnings of a real superbug civilizational threat, including bugs that are developing that are resistant to last resort antibiotics. There are antibiotics that we use and we pull out for E. coli infections or MRSA infections that no other antibiotics can treat. You know, you, you, might, you might know about colistin resistance that's occurring in China, and this is coming from pig farms. So for me, I, what I trust is a scientist who every day, like my brother-in-law, who are, are mm. curing and treating people who have MRSA, who have E. coli infections, who have Campylobacter infections. We know all those pathogens are endemic in factory farms and animal agricultural facilities. And we know from all the evidence that the drugs that are being used in these facilities are causing resistance in the human population. I'm going to jump to another subject briefly, unless you have a final okay, comment. Okay, one final thing before Please, you jump. Ahead. Less than 10% of the antibiotics used in animal agriculture are also crossed over and used in human medicine. And yet still the volume is 70 to 80% of all antibiotics, or even by your own no, concession, no, whether it's 30%, again, whether it's 30% or 70%, uh, trend. It's a massive yeah. amount of antibiotics. The total volume but what, is huge. But how many, I already said, and you well know, 10, mil, 10 billion animals produced in this country each year. Yeah. Okay. How many people in the United States? 300, 300 million. 330 million. 330 million. Okay. 330 million. So if you look at it on a per, per animal, per person basis, even at 30%, even at 50%, if it goes into animal, animal ag agriculture, the human population is the one that's still abusing the antibiotics because look at the total number of animals. On a 10 billion divided by the amount of antibiotics used compared to 330 million, the Try, problem you, is in human yeah. use of antibiotics, not in animal agriculture. Because you're saying on a, on a per animal basis, human beings are using far more antibiotics. And I think you just made a very strong case for abolishing animal agriculture, Trent, because we cannot raise and use 10 billion animals responsibly and treat them in the way that we want them to be treated without causing antibiotic resistance that, frankly, is a threat to human civilization. But here's, here's another statement that I think we'll agree on. So we're going to disagree on the use of antibiotics. 22 minutes, by the way. 22 minutes? Okay, cool. So we're going to try and no, finish. No, 22 minutes it took you to get to what you really want to accomplish, the abolishment of animal agri. I was afraid we're going to pitter-patter around this for 58 minutes and still not really get to the point you want to abolish animal agriculture, which would be detrimental to human health and would be detrimental to planet health. I cannot support that. And, and we should talk it out because I actually want you to eventually get to the point where you agree with us. And abolishing animal agriculture, for, for the record, doesn't mean hurting any individual farmers like you necessarily. You know, what we want to do is create a transformation, not unlike other major social transformations that occurred over the past 150 years. When, when we abolished human slavery in the 1850s, do you know what percentage of, of the U.S. economy was linked to slavery in 1855, for example, before the Emancipation uh, Pop Commission was signed? Take a guess. Uh, I, I could take a guess, but I don't know the answer to this. I would say about 45%. Yeah, you're about right. It's about one in three. So one of my former professors at the University of Chicago, Robert Fogel, 
who's probably done more empirical work on this than, than anyone on the planet. He went through all sorts of documents, historical records, government industry documents uh, from the 1850s and found that even in the years immediately prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, about one in three dollars in this country was directly linked to slavery. You know, it, was, it was a massive, massive industry. And, and the amount of value being produced by this industry was, was unprecedented in the history of human uh, and, and frankly, of this nation's economy, that this industry was the industry of the entire U.S. economy. Uh, and when they transformed that economy and they transformed that system, a lot of people said it couldn't be done, that, that we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the technological capacity. And guess what? Human innovation has, has very few limits to it. And when there's a necessity, people can invent new paradigms that can transform mm -hmm. the way we used to do things. And I think that's what's going to happen with animal agriculture. But before I move into that, and I think we should talk about that more, what we mean, what we mean when we say we want to abolish animal agriculture. Because when we say that, I don't say that with any hatred or bitterness in my heart towards any individual farmer. Because I know there are people like you who are good people, who are just trying to feed American citizens. I, I know this because, first of all, I grew up in central Indiana, and I knew a lot of farmers. Secondly, because my own family's farmers. I don't know if you knew this. My dad, uh, my dad experimented on animals. He was a very poor person who immigrated to this country, went to graduate school, got a visa, came to graduate school, got his green card with the support of a company in Indiana called Eli Lilly. And for decades, he actually experimented on animals. And so this is, this is, this is my guilt, my shame too. You know, it's, it's not just about us attacking farmers. It's a collective responsibility of all the people of this nation, the farmers, the animal rights activists, the vivisectors, the sons of vivisectors, to take action to, and this is, this is the next statement I want to get your, your feedback on, that I'm guessing we both agree on which is that we should all be treating animals with respect. Um, I'm guessing you agree with that statement. Absolutely. That's the key, most important thing, respect. Yeah. And, and I think that this is something really for us to elevate as animal rights activists and farmers, to recognize that farmers do believe that animals deserve to be treated with respect. And vegans and animal rights activists also deserve, know that animals deserve to be treated with respect. And you know, I want to just specifically talk about chickens a little bit. I mean, do you raise chickens? Do you know chickens very well? Trent? Out of curiosity. I know chickens. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know chickens pretty well, too, because chickens were actually the first uh, farm animals I ever rescued. And I actually rescued them. You might not believe this. I actually rescued two chickens from punk kids at a show in Chicago. <laughs> and they had grabbed these two chickens, um, put them into a pen. They bought them from a slaughterhouse in northern Chicago. And they were using mm -hmm. them in a punk show to show that politicians are chickens. And what they did was they grabbed these two chickens and in, in front of a crowd of like hundreds of screaming kids and these loudspeakers, these chickens had never been in an environment like this. They're holding them in front of the mic and saying, look at this chicken and shaking this chicken. And I got a bunch of phone calls from people at the show and said, these two chickens are being terribly abused. They're being screamed at, they're being yelled at, they're being disrespected in just egregious, horrible ways. And we just went in there and took the chickens. And the people who were, who were mistreating them said, yeah, I guess, you know, you're probably right and let us, let us take them. But, um, when we talk about respect for chickens, I think most people who are, who are not animal rights activists, and probably most farmers too, don't understand just how sophisticated chickens are. I mean, chickens understand 24 different calls. They can speak more words effectively than a two-year-old human child. Uh, they have different calls for different situations. For example, if there's a predator flying overhead, they have a different call than a predator that's coming from ground. Um, and they also have the ability to feel empathy. So there have been experiments performed where they show a mother chicken a video footage or across a glass window, just a, a little baby chick experiencing some sort of distress. Maybe you puff a little air at the baby chick and the chick gets scared. And when, when the chick gets scared, there are certain biological responses that we all go through from fear, like increased cortisone levels, increased heart rates, your eye temperature lowers when you're undergoing fear. And Trent, you know what happens to these mother chickens when they see baby chicks experiencing fear and stress? Do you know what the biological response is? Well, to protect them. Protect them, but specifically, they go through exactly the same biological response. They actually feel empathy. Their, their brains trigger the same sort of biological responses as what the chicks are going through. So their mm -hmm. heart rates increase, their cortisone levels increase, their eye temperature dis decreases, which shows that these chickens, we call them, you know, these stupid birds. We, we call them, you know, we use bird brain as an insult. But in fact, these chickens have the ability to empathize and take the perspective of another living creature and feel fear simply because another being is feeling fear. So, I mean, what, do you, what, I, what are your thoughts on that? And, and I don't, do you agree that animals have sophisticated emotional lives, that they have attachments to their families and their, their, their um, flocks I, and their herds? Well, absolutely. They have a yeah. protection. So they, all animals 
have the instinct, three instincts, eat, reproduce, and survival. Including human beings. <laughs> Including human beings. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're all the same. And if you don't do those things, you cease to exist. By the way, 99% of all species that ever existed are now extinct. Yeah, so right. we need to keep that in mind. Which is terrifying. Uh, I bet, I'm guessing we both agree that it's terrifying. No? It is terrifying, but we've slowed that rate of extinction. And I think that's pretty exciting, actually. But I would very much disagree what you, with that, but what I'd love you to are a more master, about that in a bit. But go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry Wayne, I, I didn't hear that. Yep, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What you are a master at is making this chicken story somehow translate over into food animal agriculture. And you alleviate, you've completely eroded the benefit of the chicken and particularly the egg to improving mankind. Mm -hmm. Chick egg. I start every morning with eggs. Eggs are the highest source of choline. They've got more essential nutrients than you can get in any substance that you can consume on the planet right alongside a beef. Forget all of that. In concept of what you talked about. So I live in country in, in central Nebraska where we have a decent pheasant population. We have an extremely high turkey population. Everything that you just described with those animals running out there in the wild where a lot of people who follow you believe that, you know, that's the ultimate environment for these animals. And we should just turn them all loose, take them out of the protection of a facility like you illegally entered in Petaluma. But if you put that chicken out there in, the, in this environment, it's going to die. Yeah, It's going to have the same or a greater sense of fear when the coyote is there every single day. Yeah. And so what we've done by moving the chickens in a barn, which, by the way, happened in the 60s because the USDA said in order to protect, protect the chickens, we need to put these chickens inside of a barn. Mm -hmm. And we protect them from two things. We protect them from predators. And we protect them from the elements. Sure. And the elements, it's a perfect day for me to talk about this. In central Nebraska, we're expecting to get two feet of snow yet this week, the week after Christmas. You know how many turkeys right, you should and pheasants? Berkeley. Uh, no. <laughs> it's so much nicer here, though. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the I, snow. <laughs> I can count. There's different snowflakes in Berkeley. Okay, so we can <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's good. <laughs> so we're going to have extreme death loss because of the snow yeah. that's going to happen in the Great Plains all the way from Nebraska to through the Dakotas. There is no ideal environment. But yeah. what we've been able to do in animal agriculture is to bring those chickens inside, bring those pigs inside, bring the turkeys inside and improve their daily life Yeah, it, it, because we want them to be efficient. We want them to be healthy, and at the end of the day, we want them to improve human lives. That's why we do it. So, so this is, I just want to highlight the fact that you're saying something that shows a very deep-seated common value that I think we share, which is animals' lives should be protected, that they should not have violence inflicted upon them, they should not really? suffer unnecessarily, they should not be killed unnecessarily, because you were talking about how we want to protect these chickens from predation. They're going to get killed, and that's a bad thing, right. which is great. Well, and there's so the much, I, I just want to point out, that we've got here a farmer who wants me to go to prison, an animal rights activist who's doing these demonstrations that are described as terrorism by people like you. And yet we have this common value about protecting animals from violence and harm and even death that most people would not even believe had just happened. I mean, I, I think this is powerful. And I think this is important for us to acknowledge because regardless of what happens in court and, you know, I'm going to be in court, maybe even you'll be in court in the next couple of years. I think it's important for all of our folks and all the folks on the other side, other side to understand that in a time where our nation is so divided and there's so much fighting and yelling on Twitter and on Facebook, you can find common values, deep-seated common values that two sides both deeply believe in and can respect on the other side. And I do respect that in you, Trent. I respect that you care about protecting animals from violence and even from being killed. What and I want to say, what I would say to follow up on that between you and I in that regard, Wayne, yeah. is that back in Chicago with those punk kids that were putting those chickens in unnecessary fear. Yeah. I would have went and sat down with them and said, wait a minute, let's think about what you're doing here. Let's think about uh, removing the chickens from your show for this reason, for this sure. reason, this reason. I wouldn't have just gone Grabbed in, them. broken in and, and stolen them. Yeah, I didn't steal them. They actually consented to us taking them in that particular occasion. So but see, you, also emergency you, you situations. Ba abandon those ways, which I would agree to. Yeah. And I, you know, I agree with you, Trent, <gasps> that you should always start with a conversation. And my dog's barking. Speaking of, of chickens. Is the dog needs, a vegan? Some dogs that's what I want to know. The dog, the dog wants to go outside, and she's going outside now. She's, I, I'll introduce you to my dog sometime if you're in the barrier. But I think you'd agree that what we did with this dog is a good thing, too, because this dog 
um, Lisa, she was rescued from a dog fighting ring. Men who were, you know, basically choosing to have dogs set after each other, tear each other to pieces for fun, for entertainment. But what I want to say to you is, Trent, I is think the it's dog great vegan? that you, The dog is vegan, actually. Yeah. That is not healthy for you nor your dog. Your I, I, dog's going to develop <laughs> diabetes and arthritis and all of these other issues. I would disagree Wayne. And that. Besides, that's why that dog is constantly pacing because it doesn't have meat like it's supposed to in its diet daily. And, and I've talked to the University of Pennsylvania veterinarian who's done the studies on vegetarian and vegan diets. I can cite the studies, Trent, and I, I, I appreciate your opinion. I appreciate your feedback. Uh, I'd love you to introduce, to introduce you to my dogs at some point if you visit the barrier. But I want to go back to this point about protecting animals from violence. And, and you were saying earlier that there's two feet of snow outside your house right now in Nebraska. Well, there's there are coyotes good. and predators who are going to tear these chickens apart. And it is completely unrealistic for us to throw chickens in the middle of New York City or, frankly, into the plains of Nebraska and expect them to survive or live reasonably decent lives. That's horrible. And, and I actually agree with you on that. And our goal as animal rights activists isn't to take the, the 9 billion chickens, cornishes or leghorns or whatever, and throw them out into the wild. But I think that's a straw man. That's not what animal rights activists are asking. What we're asking for is animals to be taken to sanctuary, uh, for us to use all the money that we've historically been funding to big corporations through subsidies, um, like the $200 billion in subsidies that go to farmers in the Farm Bill every five years, and instead devote that to animal care, animal shelters, where we can take these animals to sanctuaries and shelters where they can live out their lives in peace. And I don't know how much you know about my background. My background is in economics. A lot of people might say, oh, that's unrealistic. We can't pay for all these chickens to live good lives in pasture. In fact, if you look at the statistics and you look at the numbers about how much it costs to actually care for a chicken or pig, we could take about 2% of GDP, which is a lot. I'm not saying it's not a small amount, but it's two cents out of every dollar. And within one generation or less, we could cause populations of farm animals to decline by a couple orders of magnitude, from 10 million to 100 million to maybe 10 million or even a million and give every single one of those animals good lives. So when we take animals and we give them lives they deserve, treat them with respect, we don't throw them out of the wild where they're gonna to get torn to pieces by a coyote. We take them to a place called a sanctuary. Have you ever been to a farm sanctuary, Trent? I have. Uh, in Did fact, you know? Gene Bauer is one of those individuals that I've met, farm oh, awesome. sanctuary, started that in New Jersey. Have you, have you been to Watkins Glen, that sanctuary? No. Okay, no. you should go sometime. And if you get the opportunity to come to California again, I'm gonna personally commit right now to taking you to a sanctuary. Where we can okay. show you I'll a take place. you up on that. Okay, seriously. So, because this is a place but where you, we can't. you have a problem Let me with just your finish my thought real quick. Let me just finish my thought real quick. Because this is a place where the value you just talked about of protecting animals from violence and being killed is upheld mm -hmm. even better than any farm in this nation. Because these animals will never be sent to a slaughterhouse. They're never going to be killed by a predator. They're never going to be stuffed into a battery cage or in a cage-free facility. And they're going to be given the respect that you and I agree every single animal deserves. So, take me up on um, that offer. You, but finish your thought. You, you remove the most important respect that that animal has, which mm -hmm. is, okay, here's my saying. And this has made me famous, by the way, instead of what the other thing about you being a thug has not made me famous. Everything lives. I have low standards died. of fame, just so you know, Trent. Yeah. I'm not everything as famous lives. as you, so getting a, getting a thousand likes on Facebook is famous for me. But anyways, go ahead. Everything lives, everything dies, and death with a purpose gives full meaning to life. Mm -hmm. I want to serve a purpose in my death. Yeah. Nine billion farm animals serve a purpose in their life and in their death. Yeah. You put them in a sanctuary and you remove nature because what does every sanctuary do? They limit the ability to reproduce. If yeah. we continually limit the ability to reproduce right. yeah. because they're in a sanctuary, then we're going to be a part of creating extinction. Yeah, And the purpose for the animal here, which you've not allowed us to get to yet, and, and we're running short on time, is to improve human health and improve planet health. Yeah. It's documented through science. Alan Savory has done phenomenal work in sub-Saharan Africa, increasing animal population and uh, removing uh, what's it called the undesertification of South Africa thanks to animals. Because the more species you have, the greater the demand for feed, the more those animals eat. Case in point, you nearly burned up like an inferno this fall in California because we've removed logging because it wasn't kind to kill a tree and we've removed grazing because people didn't understand that when you come in and you remove those lower fuels, you prevent bigger catastrophes. Yeah. It's all part of the cycle of life. And what I hear you saying is that 
you're critical of me for putting a chicken in a barn because it's somehow not a, with nature, but yet you want to put the animals in a sanctuary, which removes them from improving human life, mm-hmm. removes their purpose in death, and you don't allow them to reproduce, which contributes to extinction. It doesn't make any sense. So Alan and Savory. Yeah. Likes. That's all it takes to get you excited. <laughs> Yeah, again, I'm not as famous as you, Trent. I got to work. You're going to have to help me out. So for those who don't know, Trent's been doing a radio show for how long? Uh, 20 years. 20 years. And, and this is, yeah. I've done, this is my first effort at, at trying to do something in a radio show where I actually have, or it's not even a radio show, it's a live stream where I have a conversation with somebody else. I should say my second opportunity because I did, I did one with Jeremy, a young actress in North Carolina last week. So I got some things to learn. But Alan Savory is also the man who's been widely discredited for claiming, if, if I'm correct, that the devastation of the landscapes of Africa and the agricultural production of Africa has been driven by wild elephants, African elephants. Am I right about that? And I'm pretty sure he's the same guy who everyone says doesn't know what he's talking about and has led to the extinction of elephants in sub-Saharan Africa. So I don't know if we should be citing him as our credible source for how animal agriculture is, is promoting human health and prosperity in the climate. Well, because Alan Savory is the also the thing- person who's caused the extinction of elephants in Africa. But let me... Let me that's ask, not true. That's absolutely false, Wayne. Well, let's look it up afterwards. Let's trade citations and research and find out what else. You said Savory everyone says. says there are a select number of people that have been critical of Alan Savory, but I can show you in Globe, Arizona, this is a great example. There was a there's a silver mine. And the silver mine, at the end of the day, every mine has tailings. Yeah. In other words, after they sort the mineral from the soil, they pile this here. And it, it's actually a sterile uh, component. It's not even soil. It's not dirt. It's just a sterile component. And on the north side of Globe, Arizona, there was this great big mountain of sterile material that every day the wind would blow from the north and it would give a blanket of junk over the town of Globe, Arizona. Globe said, you got to shut down this mine. Instead, what they did was they used cows. Yeah. And they took cows onto this sterile pile of material. They fed the cows hay. The cows ate the hay. They defecated on the pile. They created soil. They created fertility. And if you drive through Globe, Arizona today, you see a a mine tailings that used to be just a pile of just sterile dirt that now has lush pastures on it. That's the same concept that I'm talking about, how animals improve soil health, and everything comes back to soil health. If you don't have soil health, you don't have human health, you don't have life, you have China. And that's ultimately what's happened in China, as you well know. Soil health has been degraded because, well, some cases overpopulation, and now they've become this big consumer of all of the products. We, one third of the pork that we produced in this country goes to China. Yeah, because yeah. They've destroyed soil health. We have the ability to maintain soil health in conjunction with animal agriculture and improve human life. Yeah, and so, but the, the reason that's happened in lo- no small part is because large companies like Smithfield have been bought out by the Chinese government and are not just importing or exporting from the United States well, actually, to Smithfield China all the pork that's been produced in the United States. But secondly, they're exporting this technology as well. I mean, there are these multi-level factory farms in China that have been constructed that cause devastation to the local communities, sometimes 10, 20, 30 miles away. The stench is so bad that people can't even walk out of their homes. And I've been there. I've seen this. Uh, I've seen how it's affecting my people, and it's devastating. So, you know, you cite that one example, and and I'd love to hear more about this example of regenerative agriculture being driven by cows. And I can cite 99% more, you know, the 1% of cases where there's a small-time farmer that has created some good in the local environment to the 99% of cases like Smithfield, where they're devastating an entire ecosystems, entire, entire cities, frankly, entire nations with the pollution that's being emitted from these farms. But let me, that's not let, me, true, let, me let me go to another. And I, I, I hear you on that. I hear you on that. And again, we could trade studies on Alan Savory or otherwise. And, and by so the we, way, we, uh, Smithfield is not owned by the Chinese government. It's all owned by the WH Group, which is based in Hong Kong. Which is financed by the and Chinese government. And supported by group. the Chinese government. Exactly. So there, there is a minor clear. distinction between that. But if you know anything about the kleptocracy in China, where the large corporations are, even more so than the United States, run by the government, it is controlled by the Chinese government. And so well, it's Communist important for Americans to understand that well. the largest pork production company in the United States was mm-hmm. uh, their sale and their purchase was financed by the Chinese government. And all the political observers in China and in the United States, frankly, understand that corporations like WH Group are controlled by the Politburo. So if you want your food system controlled by the Politburo, by all means, of China, by all means, support Smithfield and support factory farms in the United States. 
If you don't think the Chinese government, which violates human rights, destroys the environment, tortures animals of impunity, should be controlling our food system, then it's time to vote for your do with your dollars and with your actual vote and get farm bills like the farm bill that just passed out of Congress and stop sending billions of dollars to fund corporations like Smithfield. So yeah. we agreed on hey, By the way, 80% of point. that farm bill just passed goes to food stamps, supplemental agreed. nutrition assistance programs. And that's great. That's great. So you're wanting to eliminate those as well? No, absolutely not. I think the, the food stamp program is great. What I don't like is when, like what happened in 2013 with the farm bill, $20 billion is taken out of needy kids' hands and given mm -hmm. to big ag corporations like Smithfield. So they cut the food stamp program by $20 billion in 2013. And they added something like $40 billion in insurance subsidies for big companies like Smithfield. Um, and Smithfield donates. And actually, this, is, this brings me to another point. I'm wondering if you agree on this statement, that special interests have too much control in American politics. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I okay. agree 100%. Would you agree that Smithfield is one example of this? Um, Smithfield is probably a small example. I'm not a Smithfield fan. I've been right. very critical of Smithfield Foods, but right. I want to point out a hypocrisy. And in do you know how much money they donate to various political organizations? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, you know, I, it's I, millions I and millions of dollars. I agree. <laughs> and do you know how much but, benefit they get out of that from the farm bill alone? From one law that they get passed, how much money does Smithfield make out of that law? Any guesses? No, we don't know that. I, we can estimate, and the Washington Post has made an estimate, $600 yeah. million. Dollars. So they invest um, maybe a few million, tens of millions of dollars in a local, state, and federal races. They get a $600 million return in just one bill. $600 that's, million. That's, dollars. A, that's an and estimate, is, and I hope it's not true. Well, I can show but you the I'm article I'm not a Smithfield fan, Post. Wayne. I, okay, great. And, and it and pains me to that. stick up for Smithfield only because they too often get lumped into a, a, a picture which is inaccurate. Smithfield sure. Foods, the largest pork producer in the United States, produces one-third of the pigs in this country. There's no doubt about it. But what you don't include is that they work with thousands of farm families all across this country in cooperation so that these farm families can continue to take care, in many cases, a farm that's been in their family for generations. But I want to point out a bit of hypocrisy in what you do. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of Smithfield Foods. I'm ironically not a I fan of Whole that. Foods either. Great. I appreciate that as well. And you're campaigning against... We should against start a campaign against Smithfield and Whole Foods together, Trent. But the problem with your hypocrisy is that uh, Smithfield doesn't produce any products that end up in Whole Foods. Whole Foods typically provides products from the competitors to Smithfield. They end up on Amazon, which is Whole Foods' owner. I understand that, but yeah. they they work hard at distinguishing them themselves from the Smithfield products because that's yeah. their niche. Yeah. And I don't appreciate anything that Whole Foods has done to grow their niche. Mm -hmm. you, you must have fed that dog a pork chop. It's much more calm now. <laughs> she's she's doing okay. So Maybe this dog, eating. this dog right behind me, which um, I'm gonna move this a little bit. Uh, do you know the story of this dog, Trent? Have you heard about this dog? No, this I dog's, have not. This dog's famous in the same way that you're famous to us, which is um, this dog's name is Oliver, and he was on ABC Nightline a couple years ago. Because he was rescued from a dog meat slaughterhouse. And, and we rescued him in the same way we rescued those chickens at sunrise. Um, you know, we found a slaughterhouse where dogs were getting beaten to death over and over again. Mm -hmm. They were getting clubbed over the head. A lot of them were not even fully un unconscious or deceased from the clubbing. And so they'd end up in, in the boiling vat where they kind of remove all the hair. And you hear them screaming in agony as they're being no, boiled alive. Wayne, um, nobody clubs chickens as part of their processing procedure. Well, but how do, they, how, do they, how do they, quote unquote, euthanize them? In eats. the farms. Most commonly, uh, for example, the turkey plants that I've been in, which your state is also a great, uh, your state of California, is also a great turkey producing state. There's CO2. They're gas. They're, they don't even know anything happens. They're rendered unconscious immediately because of the CO2 chamber. Well, have you seen a CO2 and box? And by the way, you and did not rescue those, those chickens. Boxes? If from sunrise, you stole them. We rescued them. And <laughs> let's talk about well, that in a moment because I'd love to hear your take on the law on this because you know, there's a difference of opinion here, and this is what we do when there are differences of opinion in a democracy. We flush them out. But um, the in a CO2 box, I think the box, outstanding 15 felonies kind of say it all. <laughs> but I just won one of my cases, Trent. Are you happy about that or sad? I didn't know. Yeah, one of the cases it was dropped just a couple of days before trial because it was actually a case involving Whole Foods, and they dropped it because they didn't want the public scrutiny. They they didn't want us to ask the questions we're going to ask at court. And frankly, all these cases. And I wouldn't be surprised if all these cases get dropped two or three days that, before because people, you know, I, one thing I want to say about you, Trent, is you're the only full person in animal ag 
who's actually been willing to come and talk to us openly and publicly, which is all the credit to you. And I think partly it's because you're smart. You know, I mean, I, I didn't know much about you until this conversation and you've done your research. You have well thought out arguments. You've got statistics and you've got good values too. Like you say the right things. A farmer says, I don't give a crap about my animals. I'm going to torture and abuse them all I want. They're not going to win the public over because you and I both know the public cares about animals, doesn't want animals to be hurt. We know that, you know, the dog who's sitting behind me is not so different from a chicken in a factory farm, that they both feel pain and pleasure. But I want to ask you two things. One is, you talk about CO2, CO2 boxes. Um, do you know what happens when an animal breathes in CO2 into their lungs? What the immediate physiological response is? I know they go to sleep and they're rendered unconscious immediately. No, and have that's you seen footage important. from inside one of those CO2 boxes? What actually mm-hmm. happens to the animals? Have you ever seen footage from a CO2 box? It hasn't happened much, but it's, we've actually had cameras inside CO2 boxes. No, I've not seen the footage. Okay. So you, I'll show, send you some footage right after this, and I'll also send you some, some scientific research that's been done about what the physiological response is when you breathe in CO2. And what happens is um, you go through what's called a respiratory spasm, right? It's not that they go to sleep quietly. The birds are, are flapping their wings. They're breaking each other's limbs. They're screaming out in agony because their lungs literally can sense they're not getting oxygen. And not only are they not getting oxygen, but CO2, when it dissolves in your lungs, it actually creates what's called carbonic acid because CO2, if you put it into water, you know, it splits up into carbon molecule or carbon atoms and, and oxygen atoms, and it forms carbonic acid. So the lungs are literally burning. They feel their lungs burning, and they go through a respiratory spasm and die, flapping their wings and screaming out in agony. But CO2 knockboxes are not the most That's common That's not true. Cause. They aren't it screaming in agony. It is, it is true, and I'll show you the footage. And, and this is the great thing about debates like this is we can have all the opinions we want, but the facts are the facts, and the footage and the photos show the facts, which is why it's so important for us to do the things that we do, to show the public what's actually happening. And why I'd encourage you and everyone else who's in – the farming industry, just open up your doors. If you really believe in transparency and facts, why can't we just come right in and take photographs and video anytime? But we'll talk it's about called that in a moment. property rights. But the actual, I well, believe in, in privacy and property well, rights. We'll talk and about that. The founding in a principles too. of this country. I agree, but so is civil disobedience and revolution when someone's committing a crime or doing something wrong. And we'll talk about the Boston Tea Party and whether those activists supported property rights or liberty and freedom. But the the, the actual most common form of death. Um, in probably, especially in turkey farming, because turkeys, they don't use CO2 boxes until they're at like 15, 20 weeks, and turkeys are usually slaughtered. At least females are slaughtered at 20, males are slaughtered at 30 weeks. The most common method of slaughter actually in a lot of these facilities isn't CO2 boxes, as bad as those are. It's called cervical dislocation. You know about this, right? I do. Okay, and have you seen it? No. Okay, I've seen well, it. I, I, actually, yes, I have. Yeah, I've seen as it many times. As a kid, times. we would cervically dislocate the head from the chicken yeah. and that's why grandma still talks about running around like a chicken with your head cut off because that is just an, a, a muscle reaction it's had all of those years and days and lives yeah, yeah. or not years in a chicken but muscles are used to moving for sure it's not a conscious effort as you portray it yeah no no i mean so you're talking about decapitation cervical dislocation is different decapitation mm-hmm. does lead birds to often run around or move and interestingly the same thing would happen to the human being or a dog when you decapitate a human being, Absolutely. and this happens, you know, like the Islamic State has decapitated some people, you'll sometimes see right. their body still moving. It's not because they're still feeling pain. You're right. I don't think anyone disagrees with the idea that when you decapitate an animal. Honestly, if, if all of animal agriculture did was decapitation, it would still be violence. I'd still be against it because that method of, quote unquote, euthanasia is, is still ending a creature's life who wants to live. But the actual method they use is cervical dislocation. What they do, and I've seen this many times, and uh, much to my, my shame and regret, my family did this with chickens. You know, my grandmother and my grandfather told me about how they do this occasionally to chickens, especially a sick chicken, is they just grab their necks and they wring them. They twist them. They cervically dislocate the neck. And this doesn't actually kill the bird necessarily. It will kill them in the long term, right? It'll kill them in the long term because if you've got a broken neck, you can't move any longer. You can't eat. You can't drink. And they cervically dislocate them and they throw them in a pile where this uh, bird, who could still be suffering, could still be conscious and alive, is thrown into a landfill, cervically dislocated. And, it's, and the reason they do this with the young birds is because you can't use, a, and they do the same with, with other animals too. Um, when they're very young, it's not efficient enough. You can't throw them into a CO2 box. They don't need enough air. It's hard to kill them with a CO2 box. It's hard to kill them using other methods. And the easiest method to kill a baby bird is just to snap their neck. And even Whole Foods, which has supposedly the highest standards in animal welfare, 
They say cervical dislocation is an appropriate method of euthanasia for young animals because they're too small. So you take the youngest, most gentle, and most innocent animals, and you use the most brutal and painful and horrific methods of quote-unquote euthanasia. And of course, euthanasia, you know, this is not euthanasia because the animals did not consent to being killed. And oftentimes these animals are completely treatable animals. If you just got them back on their feet, gave them a little food and water over the next couple of days, they'd get back on their feet. But it could be an animal who's just a little bit of a runt, who's a fall behind. And, and there's, there's a term in the turkey industry for this. They call them starbouts. All the runts, which, you know, it's anywhere from 5 to 15% of the birds will suffer in this way. All the runts that are too small to make it to slaughter, they just snap their necks. And so, so my question for you is, how can we possibly say breaking the necks of little birds, throwing them away in landfills while they're still alive, by the millions and billions, frankly, is respecting animals or respecting life in any way? No, I do not endorse throwing animals into a pile still alive. Right, right. I have no problem with uh, taking those starbouts and ending their life immediately and with respect. Yeah. Because even with that and taken into consideration, you know, there's starbouts outside. Yeah, I agree. And those starbouts, starbouts uh, the survivability the of a chicken outside is half of what it is in a modern facility, which, again, is why we put them in the barns, to increase the, the livability, the survivability, the overall efficiency. And it's all about one thing that we haven't even mentioned here yet, Wayne, and that is minimizing stress. Yeah. My job as a farmer is to do everything possible to minimize the stress of a food animal. Yeah, because yeah. I don't want to use antibiotics. I don't want to use any. I want that animal to be lead the lowest stress stress life possible because that in turn will utilize the most feedstuffs to produce the healthiest supply of food for the consumer, which is yeah. my end goal. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's so been you, left out of the equation. So you were just saying to me that you want to try and reduce the mortality rates of the animals, which I agree is a worthy cause. We don't want animals to die unnecessarily. We don't want human beings to die. We don't want them to starve. And human beings starve to death too, and it's a terrible thing. We should try to reduce the rates of malnutrition and starvation in the human population. Yeah, which, Do you know what the which, average which, rate of mortality is in a modern commercial egg farm? In a Ball commercial park? what farm? Egg farm. Because we were talking about how you were just saying we got to move the animals into the barns to keep them protected mm -hmm. from, from starvation, from predators, and so on. Do you know what the average mortality is? I don't know what, what stage you're talking about because Cumulative. half So over the 18 male. months in, a, in, a, in an egg farm, do you know what the average mortality is? I don't know that. Nationwide, it's probably something like 7%. So 7 okay. out of 100 birds will die before they even get to 18 months. Um, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and, and, you, and actually, I asked Mike at Sunrise, what's your mortality? I was just curious, and they wouldn't tell us this. And, and if you actually are proud of your mortality, why wouldn't you just tell us this? But do you know what the average mortality is at a sanctuary? <laughs> why would anybody tell you what their mortality is, Wayne? Because if they're proud of it, I mean, you just said 7% is a good number, right? If you're proud of the death number. rate then why not just publish it? Why not say, hey, we've got nothing to hide. I, I, for example, an animal sanctuary. You know, an animal sanctuary that raises, that cares for hens in actual pastures, who gives them good lies, they're not going to hide how many hens die. In fact, they celebrate it. They, they post every single hen who dies and they talk because about Because it's, it's your fundraising me mechanism. No, it's not you're us. About, I'm, I'm not a you're sanctuary. You're about so. funding, fleecing yeah. the public for funds to feed an animal and take care of an animal that's going to serve no purpose. Yeah, yeah. There so is no purpose let's go to the for an animal that doesn't reproduce and doesn't feed somebody, and even if you just fed the coyotes or fed some wildlife. But you don't do that. You probably have a ceremony, a burial, and a funeral and hide it away so that only the bugs and the mites can eat it. Yeah. But what do you what do you think the mortality rate is at a sanctuary? You just said seven percent seems like a good mortality rate. What do you think the mortality rate is at a good sanctuary? Again, mortality rate is is a death loss at some point to some point. So are you asking in me the what same is the time period, like in a year to eighteen months, from the time you take possession until it dies? Yeah, in like eighteen month time period. One hundred percent. Well, no, not in an eighteen month time period. I mean, one hundred percent. Well, every over the, over the scale died. of a life, you know, of course, everybody dies. You're right. Everybody right. dies. And we should come back to this point you made about dying with a purpose is the most important thing. So at most sanctuaries, a sanctuary that had a death rate of, of 7, 10, 15 percent would be a terrible sanctuary. <laughs> That'd be a sanctuary that would be like an animal hoarding case that we got to call an animal control and say, hey, there's right. something going on. There's like rotten animals everywhere. Animals starving and mm -hmm. animals cannibalizing each other. And, and a dog yeah. pound, you know, like someone, a dog rescue, if 7 percent of their dogs are dying every year, you know, they'd yeah. say like, somebody's got to shut this place down. Like seven well, PETA's of animals got about a hundred percent death rate because they kill all the dogs yeah, they right. get in Norfolk, Virginia. You know, I'm not I'm not here to defend PETA 
or advocate for PETA. I'm not here to defend or advocate for any particular sanctuary or any farm. I'm here to talk about the system as a whole and, and yeah. what we think is good and what we think is bad. And you just told me 7% mortality is good. And I'd say right. if someone took in, if, if some sh shelter that was adopting out dogs took in 100 mm -hmm. dogs and seven of them starved to death, We'd all be saying, this is a big problem, folks. This shelter needs to be shut down. Right. And, and if that bird saying, was outside this week, it'd be about a 50% death loss. You're right. But that's not the comparison, right? We don't have to throw yeah. dogs. Oh, that's, we don't so have you to can't throw the dogs we sanctuaries into to the Arctic a farm scenario food. either. What's that? So in the same regard, you can't compare uh, nature outside with two feet of snow. You can't compare a sanctuary to that of a farm. But you just because, did again, there is no the farm, purpose. Right? You said we can't, we can't right. leave animals to nature because of the farm. You just made that comparison. And I'm saying I agree with that. That's, you're right. We want to improve mortality rates, protect animals from predation, from disease, from the elements. But I'm saying we can go a next step and, and affirm the values that you believe in. I mean, this is not me saying this. You just said this. We want to reduce mortality rates. We want more animals to be protected from violence. Absolutely. And I'm saying let's take the next step together. And I'm saying let's work together on this. And, and frankly, let's sanctuary. start a campaign tomorrow on Smithfield Foods and say, Smithfield, those 18% of piglets, and, and the mortality rates in pig farms are even worse because these piglets, I mean, they all get thumped because every single run, every single pig that has, yeah. you know. A in little... fact, I debated Wayne Pacelli in front of state legislators in Washington, D.C. Mm. about blunt force trauma as right. the most effective way to end the pig's life, if you want to call it a star about whatever the case may be. Yeah. That is never going to look good on a video, which you profit from, by the, by the way, but I do it. Yeah. With agony every single time, because number one, I didn't want this pig to get to this point. Number two, it's not going to serve me any purpose. Yeah. But number three, it's going to die a more horrible death if I don't implement blood force trauma at this moment. Yeah. And I'm saying that's so not the universal I'm doing possibility. For the animal, you use that yeah. as a means to solicit money from people who don't understand life and death. Yeah, I mean, I think if you saw my bedroom, you'd probably wouldn't say I'm profiting too much of this, <laughs> Trent, because I live in a closet. And I'll, I'll invite you to, to come and visit my closet sometimes so you can see how I live and how the people who advocate for animals live. Because the people who work at PETA, the organization you just attacked, I mean, the average income at PETA is $30,000 a year. These people could be making two, three times more money. And I say what you want about their, their methods, their messaging, and their values. But these are good people who are sacrificing immensely, trying to make the world a better place. Not unlike you, I'm guessing. I'm guessing you could find other means of making a living for yourself where you'd make more money. But you're trying to do the right thing. You're intervening in systems that you think are bad, including animal rights activists. Because you see something wrong that's happening in the world and you try and change it, which is great. And, and what I'm saying is the difference you're saying occurs between nature, right, where these poor domesticated animals suffer and die, in a factory farm, we can make a bigger jump from a factory farm to a sanctuary. And, and the 18% of piglets, the 7% of hens that starve to death, that are cannibalized, that are thumped, those things don't have to happen. And, and no, I agree 18% with you. is that, too high on pigs. No, it's not. I can, I can show you the website, Pork Checkoff. The National Pork Board has looked at estimates. It keeps going up. And the reason is partly because of the disease. You know, more and more, you're getting all sorts of diseases, both viral and bacterial, in these, these nurseries and farrowing crates. And more and more of these pigs are dying from diseases and more of them are being euthanized very early because, uh, and also because, uh, they're, they're giving birth to more piglets. So they're, yeah. they're mass so we're, producing. we're averaging 35 pigs per cell per year now. Yeah. So that's, there's more and more piglets being born. That's a lot. That's it's a lot. more complex. than you try to, you try to boil it all down into a bumper sticker, yeah. which is going to benefit you for getting more followers and more money. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it can't be done that way. Yeah. Not much money for the record. <laughs> and I love for your help in fundraising, so we can do more support, get more support for the animal rights movement. I, I think I've been helping with your fundraising for the last fifty-two minutes now. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. And we should we should conclude soon because it's actually already nine forty-one. I really appreciate the time, right. and I, I Trent only promised us until nine thirty Pacific time, so we should leave soon. But I do want to point out the entire animal rights movement, and including HSUS. What do you think of HSUS? Good, bad, mixed? Oh, it's one of the biggest frauds that exist in this country. It's riddled with sexual harassment. It's a culture of HSUS. You know what that stands for, right? Have sex, you stay. And that absolutely needs to be exposed. And by the way, just this week, ASPCA, another huge sexual scandal. Yeah. Two of their top investigators gone because of not only allegations, but proof now that they're sexually harassing people. Paul Shapiro, Wayne Pacelli and all of those individuals are in the same camp. They utilize and they exploit animals for personal gain and they blame me for doing that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you're, you're right that sexual harassment in any organization, including ours, should be addressed directly. 
And if you've challenged us on this, you've shared some blog posts that you think you know, suggest problems with DXC in these areas. And anytime anyone, including you, has a concern about that with the animal rights movement, I encourage you to, to bring it up, address it, because you're right. There's sexual harassment at Smithfield. Smithfield's been hit with, you know, uh, with, with discrimination lawsuits. There's sexual harassment in the government. There's sexual harassment in the animal rights movement. And if we really care about human and non-human animals, including you, I mean, I care about you. If you were getting harassed by someone, you know, and I, I would stand up for you. If Mike Weber, the owner of, family, of Sunrise Family Farms, were getting harassed by any animal rights activists, you know, if, if there were an aggressive animal rights activist who's coming after him and his family, you know, Mike is a good guy. Like, if you know anything mm -hmm. about Mike, I, you know, from what I understand about uh, Mike, just on online, do you know about Mike, the owner of Sunrise? It's Arnie and Mike, the two owners. Do you know about Mike? Mm -hmm. He's he's a he's a good guy who cares a lot about the environment. Uh, his uh, daughter I can make apparently. Case you did been, harass him, Wayne. You entered his property without permission. That is a form of harassment. What, what what I what I was trying to do is bring his company into alignment with the values that he espouses publicly. Right, and his company. If you see the eggs, they sell at Whole Foods, and they do sell eggs at Whole Foods. They've got this grassy pasture, you know, chicken outside. It says American Humane Certified by the American Humane Association. Which, what do you think of AHA? Good, bad. Well, um, I'm I'm okay with H. I'm not I'm not 100 percent agreement with them, but I'm okay, okay with them. them. You like them more than Their HSUS intent is or us? Correct. Okay, that makes sense. I I, 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 I wish don't... they and you and I would spend more time worrying about the people who struggle in this country yeah, you're, instead of falsely talking about the animals that need help. Well, I'd say two things. One is human beings are suffering because of this industry too. And we talked about antibiotic resistance. We could talk about the abuses to the workers and the fact that you know undocumented workers, workers at Smithfield have been beaten up by the company. But but secondly, you know most Americans believe today that animals should have rights just like human beings, that animals should be protected from suffering just like human beings. And the proof of that is in the fact that in this conversation already, you've announced that you believe that animals should be protected from violence. So this is Absolutely. caring about human beings and caring about animals. They're one and the same. They're intersected in so many deep and profound and powerful ways. But, um, but I think I want to go back to this question of what, what, animals, what animals actually deserve from us. And, and we were talking about the transition from nature to a farm. And I was talking about the transition from a farm to, uh, to a sanctuary. And, and your perspective on this, I think, is that that sanctuary is not... What, what, what is your perspective on the sanctuary? It's just not a feasible outcome for all the animals, that there are too many benefits of, of exploiting the animals, that we can't give it up, that there's a purpose the animals have. Why can't we move all the animals from farms and slaughterhouses to sanctuaries if our goal is to give animals good lives? Well, I've explained this a couple of times. Um, number one, a sanctuary removes two forms of what we you agreed to at the beginning was important three three characteristics of a healthy purpose purposeful life yeah eat reproduce survive and they don't get a chance at, to reproduce and at the end of the day you, you improve mankind somehow in your death okay that's what i want to do that's what every pig i raise would want to do which they don't think they don't know what they want to do they're just here serving a purpose and that purpose is to improve human lives the sanctuary completely eliminates that purpose. And for me, and we didn't even get to this, which I thought we would have a long time ago, it goes back to a, a book called Genesis. Mm -hmm. Man gave dominion over animal. Mm -hmm. And I, I accept that responsibility with the proper degree of respect. And I understand that it is my job to, to minimize the stress for these animals, That's great. to use these animals to improve human lives, which is why, even though you poo-pooed it, I, I use, as one example, Alan Savory, we do it in our place. There's a plethora of people that do it. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, they improve human lives. Yeah. And then the cycle continues. Yeah. The sanctuary is a disruptor to that cycle of life. Yeah. So, and I, I, I mean, I agree with you that all animals, including non-human animals, they, if they live a life and they die with purpose, that's a beautiful thing. And we should respect that and enshrine that in, in our culture and even our own laws. And, but I, I think that most of us, when we think we die with purpose, it has to be something that we actually believe in that's good for us. It's not just something that benefits some other third party. Um, and I question, when an animal has been ripped to pieces alive, you know, and some of these egg farms in Petaluma have far higher mortality rates. And I'm guessing that the reason Mike wasn't willing to tell us his mortality rate was because it's much higher than 7%. But we know of no, other farms in I, I don't know that have, why Mike didn't tell you, but it's not just, your business. Let me just finish this thought real quick, Trent. We know of some farms that have a 20% or higher mortality rate and that the most common cause of death in these industrial-like farms is cannibalism. 
is vent pecking, is having their cloaca, their uterus pulled inside out by another animal that is ripping them apart because they've all gone insane inside of an industrial egg farm. And for that animal who's collapsed on the ground, having her internal organs ripped out, dying piece by piece, do you think in her internal worldview or in anyone's worldview, we could say that that was a death with purpose? Uh, so I've got 40 chickens. Yeah. For my own egg purposes. Mm -hmm. What's my number one cause of death? And by the way, my Predation. chickens run out, they eat insects, they do they they do what people think chickens need to do. My guess is predation. What's my number one? Absolutely. Right What's number two? Um disease. Cannibalism. Cannibalism. So my point is that's part of nature. Yeah. What I really get irritated at more than you actually, Wayne, yeah. is the people in agriculture who market our chickens are vegetarian fed and yeah. they somehow see that as an advantage. Chickens are not vegetarians. When yeah. I get a really cool bull skull, which I've got one right now that I want to get that skull cleaned off and make it so that it can be a decorative thing in my room, in my office mm -hmm. so that I can pay respects to that animal because it serves some purpose for a long period of time. I put it in with the chickens and yeah. the chickens will clean the meat off of that skull, just about sterilize it. Mm -hmm. They're not vegetarians. And that contributes yeah, back to where I started in saying that people just don't understand the cycle of life anymore. Yeah. I so, want to be a part of the cycle of life. I want to manage each cycle of the life because at the end of the day, I want to improve the planet and I want to improve human health. And I think we've done a very good job doing that. You, yeah. you remind me of Upton Sinclair. Yeah. Up, Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle. The jungle. I think it was in 19, wait, maybe 19. Okay. 1904. 1904 1905. Yeah. Because he book. was a vegan. And he wanted to expose the horrors inside of these slaughterhouses. And his own doctor told him within two years of writing the, the, the jungle that he had to start eating meat or that he was going to develop chronic illness because he was already sick. Mm -hmm. And so he went back to eating meat. So everybody knows Upton Sinclair was vegan and wrote a book to convert everybody into veganism. But they don't get the second chapter of the book, which is I had to start eating animal products again because I wasn't healthy. Or because his doctor animal gave products him bad improved advice. Human life. <laughs> Sorry. Animal products improve human lives, and that's why I'm proud to be a, an animal agriculturalist. Yeah. Well, here, I, I, we've taken up a lot of your time, so I'm, I'm going to let you have the final thought on that. And I, I just want to add that, you know, people in China and India have been vegetarian or vegan for thousands of years, and, and most medical doctors and nutritionists would say that the people in Okinawa, the people in China who have not suffered from diabetes and heart disease and cancer for the past 2,000 years, who have not even had you know, much obesity. Like it wasn't until the past 20 or 30 years in China and Taiwan when McDonald's and Burger King moved in and started selling people processed meats that we've seen kids who are suffering from obesity and diabetes. I think a lot of scientists would disagree with the idea that Upton Sinclair needed meat. He probably got bad advice uh, from his doctor. But it, let me, except let me for conclude. the scientists that's except for the scientists that study mental health mm -hmm. because 17 percent of the world's suicides are in india they've had a serious suicide problem and suicide is a direct result of not consuming animal products animal fats oh zinc, come on selenium <laughs> you're not, the board. You're not really going to go there are you on this wayne for our next one hour discussion <laughs> i'll be eating animal products solves depression if it were only that easy then we wouldn't have any depression in the world but <laughs> You you look you look at the trends yeah. in suicide and depression, and there are many clinical studies that show the number one uh, depressed and suicidal tendencies are white, educated suburbia women. They're also the most frequently to be vegan and remove animal products. Let's There's have another let's have another debate next time about correlation versus causation, and uh, and we could talk about some of these numbers because if you haven't done an RCT, Perfect. I'm not going to believe it. But let me just conclude. I want to conclude on on some common ground here because. When I started this conversation, I told you before we even got on this live stream, and I told our entire audience that that is, for me at least, the, the main goal of this. For, for me to understand your perspective more, um, for you to hopefully understand our perspective more, and for us to find common ground. And here's where I think we can find some common ground. We both believe that animals should be respected. We both believe that animals should be protected from the elements, from disease, from violence, even death. And we both believe that we want to create a sustainable world for all life. Not just for human beings, for the other life on this earth too. And so what I'm going to suggest to you is if I can show you factually that we can achieve all those objectives with a better system than animal agriculture, would you agree that you jump on board the animal rights bandwagon? And I'm going to make a, a reciprocal commitment that if you can show to me factually 
that we have to continue to have animal agriculture in order to protect animals from violence and suffering, in order to create a sustainable food system, in order to replenish the soil and the earth of, of all the beautiful resources that we have to, to allow life to nourish and flourish, I will support animal agriculture. But this is a factual question, that our values are the same. We're trying to promote life, compassion, and respect. And let's just talk through the facts. Can we agree to that? Yeah, we can agree to that. We'll Great. start with the least harm principle and go from there. I love that. I love that. So we're going to trade some studies. Uh, if you want to show me a farm, like I'd love to see this, this cattle farm you were talking about where they had a mine that was causing mass amount of uh, soil depletion and pollution that was mm -hmm. rehabilitated through animal agriculture. And I'd love to show you a sanctuary and compare that sanctuary to an egg farm like Sunrise where 10, 20, 30% of the animals are dying and being cannibalized and show you that you know, I'd love to hear more about why birds are suffering from cannibalism in your 40 hen flock. I've been working with chickens for the past 15 years of my life. I've never heard of a single animal at any sanctuary that's been cannibalized. So maybe there's some things I could teach you. Maybe there's some things you can teach me. Uh, but I think this is ultimately a factual question. And with so much hate and anger in the world right now, so many people attacking one another, insulting each other, sometimes it's good for us to step back from those debates for a moment. I'm not saying we shouldn't debate because I think there is some value in Twitter and, you know, getting a little riled up at times, but there are also important times we both need to step back from those online insults and social media, have a conversation like this, show respect for one another and say, hey, let's make a better world together. So are you down for that? I am, and I want to clarify something. Uh, I told you the number one cause of chicken death was uh, predators. Predators. True story. Okay. I said the number two cause was cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that it only takes one animal. Yeah out of every three years to be the second leading cause of cannibalism. So Gosh. if one animal gets eaten by another animal in three years, it that's, is your second leading cause of death behind yeah, that depredation. That's how numbers get okay. skewed. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I definitely was not trying to tarnish uh, you or, or, or your practices in any way because I don't know anything about them. And, and again, I'd love to visit your farm too someday if you'd let me do that. Um, maybe we can make that happen. Uh, I'm but you're, guessing your criminal history has a hard time getting you uh, invitations to farms, Wayne. That that is therein lies your problem. Yeah, maybe. But I, I I will tell you there's there's one farm. The Pittman family farm folks have been extremely generous and kind to me personally. They're good people. They're people of faith, like yourself. Um, I've had great conversations with Rick. He's a good guy, and they released 100 turkeys dust just this past November, um, for better or for worse. And they said, you know, we don't support this prosecution because we recognize there were some things that you found that we don't agree with. We don't like this happening in our farms. You know, we don't like the fact that their birds collapse on the ground being slowly torn to pieces. We don't like the fact that you know, we're using antibiotics and maybe the public didn't know about this. Um, and we bought this company, we're gonna try and make some changes. And what I'd hope is in the future, whether it's animal rights activists getting criticized by you, like you made some corrections to me, right? You, know, you told me about Iowa State versus University of Iowa, which you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm in California, I don't know crap about that sort of thing, or I don't know anything about that sort of thing. So I'm gonna learn and make some changes and make sure I don't make those misstatements. And what I love about people like you and probably the Pittmans is if we make a critique and you think, you know what, I don't like a lot of this guy says, but this point that he's making, there is some validity to that. And I'm going to make some changes. Instead of fighting and digging our heels in deeper and trying to destroy one another, let's actually concede when the other side makes a good point and try and build a better world together. And I think that's what the Pittmans are doing with us. I hope that's what you'll do with us. I hope that's what Mike does with us. I hope that's what Arnie does with us. I know Arnie does not like me. Arnie's the other owner of Sunrise Farms. He was extremely angry at the time. I think he probably maybe more than any else in Northern California wants me to spend prison, spend the rest of my life in prison. But I hope someday, even if I'm in prison, we can have a conversation after I get out. He understands that there's so much more we get out of the world if we work together rather than against each other. And that's true even of animal rights activists and, and animal farmers. I'll give you one thing, Wayne. You got the busiest closet I've ever seen. There's people walking <laughs> back and forth. You got people going on in and out of that closet like never before. It's because we I, I think <laughs> people are coming out of the closet at your place in Berkeley, California. <laughs> So this is actually not my room. This is not my closet. This is our tech room, which, you know, a couple other activists live in here. But the reason people are moving out in and out all the time is because we're all super poor activists and we have to stuff ourselves into a big house together. That's the only way you can afford rent in a place like Berkeley. But if I come out to your house, maybe you can give me a little more room than I have. And um, if you come to our house, I'm always happy to give you a place to stay so we can have future conversations. Okay? Okay. Thanks okay, for Thank the you call. very much. Uh, happy holidays to you, Trent. Um, Merry Christmas or whatever it is you celebrate. I think you said you're Christian. It is Christmas. Okay. Well, Merry Christmas. And I hope I wish the best for you and your family this holiday season. And I hope all your dreams and expectations of 2019 happen. And I hope we continue this conversation.
Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Okay, I'm ending the live video now. Hey, thanks a lot, Trent. I, I just.